Now, it's impossible to comment. I've got a strict four minutes, 30 seconds on all of these points, and I'm sure we've got lots of questions, so I'll just move on. Um, but to begin with, I want to really bring this back. I want to comment on what this session is about, and that's nicotine past, present, and future. Now, we know that nicotine has had a controversial past, strongly being associated with addictions and the harms of combustible tobacco. And currently, and that's why we're, we are all here, we are being presented with a huge potential for harm reduction. But I think, and that's what I want to talk about, is moving this into the future is tentative unless we can deliver clear public health messages to consumers. And it's consumers that I really want to bring into light in my uh, discussant, my response. So in my work with vapours um, over the last 12 months, ordinary everyday vapours, I'm not talking about advocates, I'm not talking about people that read journals, everyday vapours, there's one common question. Sharon, are these things OK? Are they safe? And I think that it is he in helping to answer this in a clear, concise and repetitive manner, which will help support the future of reduced harm products and support behaviour change. So Eric has highlighted one stat from the ASH survey that in the UK, it is true, there are a large amount of people that have tried e-cigarettes and they're not sticking to them. Now, we could interpret that as poor devices, lack of fit, devices not being user-friendly, or that they're not satisfying smokers. All of these things are true. But within the same survey, there is also this alarming stat, which has been mentioned a few times this morning and also... Uh, yesterday, that a huge number of people perceive vaping as more or equally as harmful to smoking. And I believe that it is this, and not just products, that is making it hard for people to quit and to stay quit. And in my work, I talk to people that have made the switch to vaping, and they've gone back to smoking because of the headlines, the, <laughs> the press, we know. We've seen them, we've seen them on slides, and uh, those of us in the UK, we face it daily. It is a problem. So providing reduced nicotine cigarettes could be one answer if we want to widen consumer choice. But in my mind, this type of product, along with the new, and I've got an example here, cautious labelling, places nicotine on a platform that will serve to just further confuse the public. If smoking's the problem, then why all the fuss about nicotine? Why are we making it hard for people to get to the facts? So though I am in favour of consumer choice, I'm not sure if reduced product, reduced nicotine cigarettes are actually being proposed as a choice. And I think choice matters. Um, I'd also be interested to know and hear about reduced nicotine cigarettes in those communities where there are high levels of nicotine dependence. And as an example of my work in the homeless community in the UK, where time has stood still, 80% of the homeless community in the UK smoke. There is so much more for this community in smoking than just nicotine and good delivery. So I would foresee high levels of compensatory puffing in this community if we were to introduce reduced nicotine cigarettes. And I'm just not sure, and based on the excellent talk we had this morning by Helen, and I would like to hear what she thinks about this, I'm just not sure if it's right or moral to take away the pleasurable part of smoking for the most deprived smokers and leave them with the part that we know, historically, it kills them. So I think we need two things. I think we need more realistic samples. And Eric, I'd be interested to know about your inclusion criteria and your e exclusion criteria. But it's not just these studies, it's all studies. We need more realistic samples. And we need to include consumer choice because choice matters. People will buy things that they want to buy. Why aren't we asking them? So, moving on to uh, Neil Benevitz's presentation, he highlights two significant points here, I think, for consumers. The first is that nicotine may be more or less addictive, depending on how it is delivered. And I am concerned that the, that the stemming of product development and availability through conservative sanctions means that this line of inquiry, which could be hugely beneficial to consumers, will be slowed down or restricted and remain in lab-based studies. So product development can help science to help consumers, and this seems clear, but we need more development, not less. We need more availability, not less. And as Professor Benevitz highlights, why do we restrict nic nicotine? Users self-titrate. And as noted by Eric in the ASH survey, large numbers of smokers find e-cigs not appealing, 
and allowing higher levels of nicotine is likely to increase that appeal, perhaps. And we had this discussion only yesterday in Catherine Kimber's presentation that when people first switch, they need higher levels. They need higher levels and they need support. And indeed, myself, Catherine Kimber, Leon Cosmider, who's here, and Lynn Dawkins have some data uh, that's currently in preparation for this and hopefully will be published later this year. But importantly, I think what uh, Neil has highlighted is that the continuum of, of nicotine may not be advisable for those with some pre-existing medical conditions. Oh, oh, I'm nearly done. That's the last page, I promise. And I think that it is in these groups, these groups, the people who are already disabled, those people who are already unwell, that we owe it to, to get our story straight, to get some clear health messages with a sense of urgency. In the UK, we have Louise Ross, we have Cyrus Salim, who's unfortunately not here, we have Linda Bald, but it's not enough. We need more, more clear mess messaging. And lastly, and it is lastly, I, would like, I like the point that Michael made, that we could look back with surprise that anybody smoked, that whether this is in 10, 20 or 50 years is not clear. And I like the quote that Sarah Jakes reminded me of in my homeless project, that in doing this, we leave no smoker be behind. So, advances in technology have allowed for the development of novel nicotine delivery systems, and technology will continue to evolve and improve. We should embrace this technology to allow us to develop a wide range of reduced harm products which are attractive to current vapours, but also remain in smokers. Thank you. So my academic wrangling wasn't entirely successful, but we have got about 15 minutes for um, questions. So uh, the first one I've seen is Attila here. Has someone got a microphone? Uh, hi, yeah, this is Dr. Attila Danko from New Nicotine Alliance Australia. Uh, my question is to the panel, uh, just about the ethics of a very low nicotine cigarette um, type of strategy. It struck me, uh, Eric, that um, with the slide on showing the effects of smoking and compensatory smoking, um, that the initial baseline, it appeared that the, when they started taking them, they actually did um, smoke a lot more of them. Uh, and then it was a bit like, well, there's not much point doing this anymore, so I might as well give up on smoking so much. Um, in the same way that you might think if you wanted to treat sexually transmitted diseases by giving an orgasm blocker type of medication um, so that, you know, you can be pumping away and nothing happens. So you just basically <laughs> stop doing it. Um, and I just wonder what people would think about the ethics of such a drug to reduce HIV and STDs. It's a reasonable proposition. <laughs> I'm not going to touch the analogy, but... Um... <laughs> Uh, then yeah, okay. Um, I think the ethics are, an, are something we have to consider. I'm not trying to shy away from this issue, and that's why I try to point out that, and recognize from the beginning that this sort of idea is a more intrusive public health policy and has to be held to a higher criteria than less intrusive policies that if they're effective. So it's so I don't disagree with that discussion at all. Um, I guess, you know, f people will always debate uh, in the public health community as to how substantial the harms have to be in order to consider constraints on freedom, right? And that's a, that is what this boils down to, to some extent. I'm not sure I have the answer to that. I think it's a discussion that people need to consider. I understand the concern about um, taking the pleasure away from people who, particularly vulnerable populations, who may have little other pleasure that they can turn to and that they think, and that that may help them in some way. And I actually think that it's critical that in considering nicotine reduction, we look at those populations. In the studies done to date, we have largely excluded them, mostly for safety reasons. We wanted to know whether or not there were harms associated with nicotine reduction, for example, increased depression in relatively healthy individuals before moving on to people with major depressive disorder. However, we now are moving into that and trying to understand what additional harms are posed to populations that are low socioeconomic status, high rate of dependence, um, uh, smokers with schizophrenia, and so forth. Those are critically important questions that I think have to be addressed. 
But again, I think this, there's an issue of just trying, uh, of an ongoing discussion about the trade-off between harm and whether or not current innovations will solve that problem, which I hope they do. I hope I'm not necessary. I hope nicotine reduction isn't necessary. And the potential that they are necessary and how far do, are we willing to go to reduce those harms? Clive next. Um, Neil, thank you very much for an extremely informative presentation. But the risk assessment isn't really anything unless it's sort of quantified in, in some way. So I, I was just wondering, we see, we, see lots of, we see lots of data coming with lots of studies where people have found a physiological change in the body and attributed it to nicotine. But then when you look at the, the, the long-term data on uh, you know, long-term NRT use or snooze use, it doesn't seem to be turning up as disease. You know, we've got the thing about brain development in, in mice exposed, but is there any sign of um, you know, adverse brain development in the generations we've had of smokers who've used nicotine? So what I was wondering is if you, if you, could, if you were explaining that presentation that you just gave to a, a smoker and you just had a a few seconds or, you know, as a consultative thing, what would you actually say? What, how would you compare the risks that you're talking about to the risks of smoking? What would you actually sort of counsel them to do? And if I, if I may be so bold, uh, a second part to the question, what do you think of the literature suggesting there may be benefits associated with nicotine use? Uh, I think the first, the first question, well, I, we, we don't have quantitative data as much as, as we would like because it's impossible to dissociate effects of nicotine from smoking. So all we have for long-term use is snus, which looks relatively safe, although there were, there were some concerns. So I think I would tell, to tell someone that switching to a less harmful nicotine product, any non-combusted nicotine, is going to be uh, beneficial to your health if you can quit smoking. No question about that. Um, the other issue in terms of beneficial effects is interesting. Um, people only smoke cigarettes because they're marketed cigarettes with nicotine. And, and once people become dependent on nicotine, they, they like it like other drugs and, and they need it be, both because of perceived positive effects, because of dealing with withdrawal symptoms. It's not clear to me, though, that the function of a smoker is any better than a person who is never a smoker in terms of cognitive function, in terms of mood. Um, so there's, it, I think there's still a debate about whether nicotine does enhance cognition or performance um, in someone who never became addicted. I certainly acknowledge the fact that smokers um, get benefit from the cigarettes once they are a smoker. Um, but the question about whether society would be okay without nicotine, I mean, I think it probably would be. Um, of course, it, it's just a, uh, my, my feeling about it. There, there are no data. Uh, th 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 does that address your question? Uh, I, well, I was really, I was edging towards like park, people say nicotine might be beneficial in terms of Parkinson's disease, for example. Well, th there are some specific um, diseases that um, might be beneficial. Smoking certainly wouldn't. Um, there, there's been specula there, there are good data about things like ulcerative colitis showing that it's beneficial. Um, there are data in Parkinson's and some in Alzheimer's, conflicting data with Alzheimer's, uh, suggesting that probably because of down-regulation of nicotinic receptors over time has got a protective effect in terms of brain injury. But um, using nicotine lifelong to prevent Parkinsonism at age 60, the, the question is, is benefits versus risks. For dementia, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about the delivery system because vascular dementia, which is more prevalent than Alzheimer's, is worse with cigarette smoking and not protected by, by nicotine. Alzheimer's might be, but when you're demented, you're demented. And, and so it's, a, it's hard to work, work out that equation. There, there's another interesting thing, just as an aside, where it does look like there is some benefit, and the World Anti-Doping Association is looking at this question, nicotine for sports, because there are some people like cross-country racers who think they, they do better with nicotine, and they, they very well might. It is a stimulant of drug, and so, Athletes actually might get some benefit from it. 
Thank you, Neil. Um, we do have quite a few hands up, so if we could keep the questions and answers fairly brief. Uh, the next hand I saw was Jeannie, and following Jeannie, uh, Deborah. Uh, thank you. Um, my question's to Michael, and it's about the innovation and research. Um, and there were, it was really interesting comparisons that you put there with the different industries. And I wonder, my question is about how much do you think the, um, some of the regulatory issues that prevent um, uh, consultation, talking, research in tobacco and nicotine areas and any, uh, particularly Article 5.3 is misinterpretation of any any discussions or talking with tobacco or tobacco companies is inhibited and restricted and may continue to restrict such um, innovative developments if that continues. And it also goes to what Sharon said at the end in terms of the communication and how, how much do you think that the lack of communication we can have now is, is a part of some of the strict interpretations of regulation? It's a, really good, it's a really good question and one that I, I hadn't really considered before. I think, I think you're right, you know, it's a very interesting way in which the tobacco industry is not parallel to, to some of the other industries that I, that I mentioned insofar as there are no regulations that prevent uh, computer, um, you know, microchip um, processing manufacturers to talking to folks who build RAM or, you know, build the circuit board. There's, there's, there's all sorts of free communication um, amongst players to ensure rapid innovation in those fields. I think at the same time, you know, now that the big tobacco companies have uh, started to commit very substantial resources, I think uh, largely those centers of excellence have probably now drifted there, where it did start in people's garages. People, um, you know, uh, I had founded a company years ago. We literally worked out of a garage for, for the better part of uh, the life of that company, um, trying to innovate and control particle size, for instance. So, you know, some of that stuff, I think early days um, can be done by individuals, but as industries mature, uh, the sort of deep R&D um, investments that those companies can bring, certainly lack of, um, Lack of discussion is, is never a good thing, uh, but I really don't have an informed opinion on how much it could rate limit some of the innovation. So. Um, Deborah Arnott from Ash. Uh, great presentations and very thoughtful um, response from Sharon as discussant. Um, I've got two questions for, Derek, for Eric. And I, Eric, I know you're very well intentioned and I understand what you're trying to achieve, but I have very real concerns on nicotine reduction for two particular reasons. First, having been involved in um, discussions with the Article 9 and 10 working group of the FCTC around nicotine reduction, what was very clear was it was help reinforcing um, the misperception that nicotine's the problem, not the smoking. Um, and that is a very, very significant problem. It's a problem everywhere, um, high-income, middle-income, low-income countries. And I think by pushing this agenda forward, we're actually reinforcing misperceptions, not helping. That's the first point, um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. The second is, I know your feeling is that because the products aren't sufficiently, sufficiently satisfying, we need the stick to be um, nicotine reduction to get better innovation. But I, I really feel, you know, have, is, does that really address the human rights issue that is not appropriate to take away from people the product that is working for them um, when the other the products that will be less harmful are not available either sufficiently geographically or uh, wherever, but also actually we need more innovation and I'm not sure the stick is the best way to get that innovation. So sure, um, so the, the, the risk perception issue, I mean you and I have talked about this on several occasions and I, and I agree that there is a significant problem and it's likely contributing to the lack of uptake of alternative products this confounding of nicotine and harm um, that, I, that I think has a long history. We have taught people for decades that nicotine is the kind of primary reason for smoking, that it, we've demonized it in cigarettes as the constituent that all smokers worry about. And in many ways, the byproduct of that teaching, which was about addiction, um, led to the misperception uh, of harm related to it. And, and so there's a long history of this that will be very hard to overcome. Um, a couple of thoughts about it. So one is um, that despite the fact that this is nowhere on people's radar. I mean, if, if you ask the average citizen what they think about nicotine reduction, they say, huh? 
They have no idea that people, scientists, talk about this. So this is not on the radar. And yet, we still have this continued misperception growing. Now, it could make that problem worse, um, in which case I think that's a significant issue. Um, I think there's two, two things to consider related to that. One is, if it makes the problem worse, does it make the behavior worse? Does it make switching worse? I think we need to understand that relationship between the misperception of harm and product switching much more than we do now. But the other is how to message and correct the message. What's the most effective way to, to clarify that it is in fact not the nicotine that causes most of the harm? And, and I don't think we know the answer to that. We've done a terrible job of it so far, so we clearly don't know the answer. I think it's worth assessing whether or not a message that is nicotine is part of the future of this marketplace, but not a part of the future of the product that kills, the combusted product, is a message that might resonate, that might help dissociate nicotine from the harm. It's a bit of a different approach. It may not be true, but it's worth considering. And now I forgot your second question. <laughs> Shoot. Human rights. Oh, the, yes, right. Um, I'm trying to remember the details of it, but I think I understand the, the gist of it. Um, I do think there are some assumptions we make about the harms related to nicotine reduction. One is compensation, that despite the evidence that we all assume it will happen, we just haven't seen it yet. And that could be true, but I would encourage people to look at the data that we do have to suggest that it may not be true. And the other, and Neil kind of referred to this a little bit, is the assumption that, there, that the reduction of nicotine will cause mayhem. That is, that individuals will suffer dramatically, some pockets of individuals in particular, will certainly suffer dramatically from the reduction of nicotine in the product. That's an assumption um, that I'm not convinced is true, and, and certainly not convinced it's true to the extent to which it's embedded in the culture. Um, I think we credit nicotine with a lot of benefits that are often related to the behavior of smoking and maybe not the drug itself. Um, and so I think those are assumptions we need to discuss and talk about and not just put our faith in. Thank you, Eric. Unfortunately, I know there's lots of questions still to be asked, but we have completely run out of time. Um, I've been asked just to remind the, the media in the room that there's a press briefing on the SNUS legal challenge uh, in Rumi at 1.20. Um, and on that note, I think it's lunchtime for everybody. Could we please thank our panellists for a really fascinating session. Thank you.